Welcome to Crypto Sapiens, a show that hosts lively discussions with innovative Web3 builders to help you learn about decentralized money systems, including Ethereum, Bitcoin, and DeFi. The podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only, and it is not financial advice. Crypto Sapiens is presented in partnership with Bankless DAO, a movement for pioneers seeking freedom from the limitations of the traditional financial system. Bankless DAO will help the world go bankless by creating user-friendly on-ramps for people to discover decentralized financial technologies through education, media, and culture. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Crypto Sapiens. And today we are talking with Nathan, ecosystem lead at Snapshot, to discuss digital governance and the role that Snapshot, the decentralized voting system, plays in it. We kick off the conversation with an introduction to Nathan and unpack his interest in political philosophy from a young age. He recounts his desire to learn more about the subject, eventually leading him to study political philosophy in college. He shares his initial exposure to Web3 and contributions to it as a writer, eventually leading him to learn about Snapshot, write a deep dive about it, and meet its founder, Fabian, with whom he hit it off immediately. We explore the Snapshot platform, its humble beginnings, and the role it now plays in the governance of protocols and communities, touching on some of the unique attributes that make it an invaluable tool in the Web3 ecosystem. As Nathan says, Snapshot exists to help humans participate in communities they are part of. There's lots to unpack in this episode, so without further ado, let's get started. I think it's a, it's a, it's in many ways maybe an inspiring story for non-devs, you know, because crypto is about so much more than development. However, jobs in crypto are very often development roles because we're we're still in the building stage. Uh, so um, let's start at the beginning. Uh, I'm Nathan. I'm from Brussels. Uh, if you hadn't noticed by now, uh, French is my main language. Uh, and, and basically, from a very young age, I started becoming super interested in political philosophy. And this was always kind of from the standpoint of, I don't understand how the world works. And in general, it feels like what I'm learning about and reading about, about democracy, about, you know, the how humans should be key in decision making in societies but actually, I don't see it. In the real world, I don't see it. And this translated into me going into university and studying a lot of political philosophy. And political philosophy sounds slightly boring. It's actually cool. It's like all the cool stuff about politics without deep politicians. So <laughs> you're, you're learning about ideas that have decided how we organize societies for millennia. And very often, these ideas are quite cyclical. And there's not... There's not really an evolution of political philosophy in the same way that there's an evolution of technology, you know, something very deterministic uh, up and to the right. You know, it's, it's a very complex topic. And I decided that my main area that I wanted to focus on and, and research more was big tech. So big tech has such an important role into our lives. Google, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, they're, they're, they're key to how we live our lives. They're key to how we even enjoy our free time. And I thought that was maybe too much, actually. Maybe they had too much power you know, concerning what we do and what we decide. And maybe actually human agency, you know, the, the reason why we make decisions independently was actually threatened by uh, what, what is called today surveillance capitalism. So the idea that these companies are, are looking at you, they're learning from your behavior, and they're getting better and better at predicting your future actions. And if you want the, the, the last stage of predicting your future actions is pushing you in a certain direction. And if you think about it, that's, that's the end of free will. You know, it, this is very dramatic, but this is kind of where we were going, where we're going, it, it, it's hard to say. So I studied this for a long time and I just kind of got frustrated because there was no real answer from there's not that much as a single human you can do. It's not like politics where you can go on the street and, you know, <laughs> protest for better laws or protest for a different government. Here, you, you can't protest for 
a different Google, you can try, but it's a private company. So I thought, like, what are our options to to rebel against this, to to find another way? And this is around the time I discovered uh, Ethereum. So like many people, I heard about Bitcoin. I thought it was a cool idea, but not that re- you know relevant to my life or my ideals. But Ethereum, it, it's something completely different. It's like this platform which is completely independent, completely neutral, permissionless. Anyone can access it. And, you know, that's in a way it's extremely dangerous, but in another more important way, it's extremely liberating. And, you know, I thought, let's try it. Let's get into crypto a little bit. Let's dip my toes in the water. And so I started writing. I started writing articles about crypto, articles about what I understood of crypto and how, you know, Ethereum and blockchains in general could change the way that the world functions and could challenge the hegemony of big tech. And I continued writing and then this news publication kind of came to me and said, you know, oh, I can stand it. I can't remember exactly. It was a long time ago. I think I'm, I'm talking here like January 2020. Uh, I came to this publication called uh, Crypto Briefing and uh, their research arm called Symmetry. And basically, I started writing deep dives into protocols that I found interesting. So I would write, uh, you know, 2,000, 3,000 words article to about like protocols I liked, met the team, chatted with them, what were their ideals, where did they see their protocol going, all of that kind of stuff. And I, I found that fascinating. You know, these were fascinating meetings because... It takes a lot to be a founder in crypto. It takes, you know, a, a very strong mental, and, and especially, you know, back in 2020. Now maybe everyone is <laughs> is laughing about like how much VC money there is, but early 2020, it, it, it just wasn't the case. Um, actually, now I'm thinking about it. Um, yeah, I might be confused on my dates, but whatever. Uh, and the idea is, I. I stayed here and I learned tons about crypto. And I was paid to do it, which is, <laughs> and I remember my uh, my supervisor uh, at the time, my editor in chief, he told me the best asset to hold in a bear market is a good job. And I still I still say that sentence lately, at least uh, two three times a day to people who come and talk to me. Uh, you know, a little bit scared about uh, an impending bear market. Um, and basically, from there while doing one of these deep dives, I did a deep dive on uh, snapshots. And, you know, I I was thinking about it. I thought the project was awesome. And then I met Fabien, the founder of Snapshot. And, you know, we hit it off super well. At the time, it was still, uh, it was just him and two part-time developers. Uh, but it was mostly him, like, holding the house together. And the beginning of Snapshot, it, it, it's extremely humble. You know, it's, surviving off of grants from uh, Balancer, Curve, uh, Gitcoin. You know, it, it, Snapshot has never made a cent in its life. So it was very humble beginnings. And, and I love the project because to me, if you make the voting systems independent and uncontestable, this opens the door to so much. There's so many countries in the world that where, where the, the population would kill for <laughs> free and open elections. And this is what was building. We're, you know, we're using blockchains to favor kinds of, uh, you know, blockchain voting. I think it is an incredible use case of blockchain. So, you know, I didn't think too much about it, and I just jumped in. Uh, that was back in uh, August 2021, and uh, yeah, since then I haven't looked back. It, it's been a, a, an amazing ride at Snapshot, and I'm still just as in love with the mission as I used to be. Wow. That's an amazing story. Uh, and again, this is one of the reasons why at Crypto Sapiens we do podcasts different, I think. We do believe that there is value in the journey of individuals that are coming in from, you know, maybe more traditional backgrounds, learn about web3, crypto, whatever you want to call it, uh make a transition into this space, find really kind of the clear differentiators uh, and start building in that space that they're very passionate about. 
And I think your story just kind of emphasizes that. So thank you so much for sharing that. You're welcome. I, I now realize it was a very long story. I'm sorry to the listeners for that. No, not at all. I, I mean, I think that, you know, it could be longer. This is really your platform, right? So anything that you wish to share, anything that you think is important to helping our community understand, you know, what it means to be someone who is crypto curious, right? Like they maybe have friends who have shared with them, you know, their own story of, you know, cryptocurrencies in terms of like maybe they bought into Bitcoin or Ethereum and that's where they're currently at. Or maybe their friends are maybe a little deeper down the rabbit hole and they are contributing to DAOs and they're just scratching their heads and going, I like what you're talking about, but I still don't get a sense of like how I could fit into this world. You know, I think your story, like many of the others that have come, you know, onto this platform is important for people to really get a good grasp and into the diversity of ideas and backgrounds that make up this space and really why this space is so rich and important, in my opinion, is because of the different backgrounds that make this space up. Yeah, absolutely. I, I always think about like, how come every time I go to a big convention or a big crypto event, I end up, you know, getting along super well with the people there. Uh, and obviously we, we have a major shared interest, but also I think like crypto has such a polarizing reputation sometimes that very often the first thing you hear about crypto is negative. If you're outside of crypto, very often you're going to hear like a crazy story about someone who ran away with, with millions. And if you stop there, then your opinion forever is crypto is kind of, like this scammy thing, uh, I don't really know what it's about. And it takes curious people to kind of dig in a little bit more, to think, all right, I've heard this, but what is this crypto thing about anyway? What, what are the, the, the ethos? Uh, what, is the, what is the reason why people like it so much? And I think these curious people, they're always super interesting to talk to. And that's kind of how, you know, people in crypto end up getting along quite well, I think. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you say that because I think we all have friends who haven't fallen into the crypto rabbit hole. They might have heard of it, probably from us, but they themselves uh, have made a decision to not get more involved. But the stories they hear, certainly the some of the stories that they've shared with me tend to revolve around some of the negative feedback, to your point earlier that maybe is the breaking news that uh, traditional media seeks to kind of hang on to, 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 to kind of speak to the space. And I think, sadly, uh, I think that there's an opportunity there for traditional media to kind of explore the space and really be, uh, you know, influential and, and important to uh, helping facilitate a lot of these emergent qualities of coordination, of uh, human relationships, of technological development, and so on. Uh, but, you know, it's probably not what gets clicks, right? No, it's absolutely that. I, I worked in journalism a little bit, and I can tell you, like, the bad stories get so many more views than the good ones. It's absolutely nuts. Yeah. And, you know, so it, some of these friends, though, they, they, some of my friends actually may have already bought into, you know, some assets that they did their own research and they think is valuable to them and, you know, just kind of aligns to maybe their own investment thesis or whatever. But when I see them, they don't talk about that. Sometimes they'll be like, oh, you know, so what I'm hearing is that, you know, this is really bad for the environment or whatever the current narrative is to kind of shift uh, the kind of some of the positive stories that are happening in the space of Web3 to some of the more negative uh, ideas that may not necessarily uh, be justified, right? I'm not saying that they're untrue, but maybe not justified. Um, and, you know, it's, a, it's just really interesting. And so in our own very small way, we hope that we're making a difference. And certainly I've turned a lot of my friends onto this podcast and many other ones that I think are doing incredible work in the space of Web3. And they come back to me, it's like, oh, I heard this story of this one person that you had or of this other podcast that they had. And I'm like, oh yeah, tell me about that. And, and they're, really, they're, they're, they're really interested in that idea that this can be more than just like financial. And I think that may be a good segue to talk about like Snapshot, right? Because Snapshot is 
looking at this beyond just like the financial element of uh, crypto and Web3. And it's looking at like the human coordination and governance level. And I think really ties in nicely to your story of uh, uh, studying political philosophy. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the idea really is blockchains, first blockchains are infrastructure. I don't think blockchains are, are inherently good or bad. This, you know, an axe can be extremely good if you're cutting wood and extremely bad if you're cutting heads, you know. So tools in general aren't inherently good or bad. So a blockchain, what does it do? A blockchain is, is just trust. Basically, it builds a platform that is solid enough for you to build something on top of it without having to fear that it's going to get hacked or that it's going to get exploited. And the way it does this is not through seven different passwords, but simply by releasing the information publicly to everyone, but putting it in the hands of as many people as possible so that it becomes extremely complex to change the mind of 51% of you know, the, the validators or the miners or uh, you know, whoever is uh, responsible for the consensus on the blockchain. So that is extremely uh, a very interesting use case for money because if what conserves my money is this you know, bank account, how you know, trustworthy is that bank account? People are going to be able to exploit it. Is the bank going to go under? Is the bank going to lie about my, uh, what I've got? Or is the bank going to exploit my data? All of these are, are kind of valid questions you can ask. And on a blockchain, it's much easier to answer. Well, you know, nobody's going to be able to exploit it if the blockchain is robust enough at, at the moment. I don't think it's it's even like realistic if you had a hundred billion dollars to attack Bitcoin. It, it would take like so much <laughs> mining hardware. You know, you would need half the half the super uh, the um, superconductors. You know, the the, the the computer chips in the world. It would be extremely hard. And so, money is a good use case. Cryptocurrencies. Here we go. But for me, an even more interesting use case is is voting. It's data in general. There's loads of data that you'd want to have on a blockchain. And voting is a very good one because how do you prove that votes weren't tampered with? How do you prove that nobody during, you know, the, the, the moment between the moment you put your vote in the, in the black box and the moment the, the votes appear on TV for your entire country, who knows what could have happened? And <clears throat> what's really interesting is with a blockchain, you can kind of remove the trust element that is necessary for you to say, okay, I, I, I trust that my vote was well counted uh, during these elections. And every time actually there's a recount in the US or something, like the amount of votes change. And, and that's absolutely crazy because it means that <laughs> there's definitely some amount of error, some margin of error between the very first vote recorded and, and you know, and the moment where it's shown on TV. So I think blockchain voting is a very, very good idea, and it's a very good thing to put in place. Now, the problem is blockchains, you're paying for the space that you're using on a blockchain, and this can very quickly become a lot of money. Right now, voting on Ethereum, it's probably going to set you back between 10 and $20. Maybe with, with the price of ETH going down a little bit, maybe it's a tad lower than that, but it's still... You know, nobody wants to vote. Maybe for federal elections, you'd be happy to vote with six or seven dollars. That's probably what it costs uh, in the real world anyway. But for smaller things, there's no way you're paying that for your it, it's it's just too much. So Snapshot was born out of the necessity for, you know, much more flexible, but also much cheaper voting, but still cryptographically secured. So what you're going to do is you sign a message with your wallet and then we're going to look at the blockchain and see how many tokens you've got and then calculate the results based on that instead of having to do a costly transaction on our blockchain. So that's kind of like the origin of Snapshot. Yeah, so maybe briefly, and I know you kind of uh, alluded to some of this already in terms of the way that Snapshot works, but just give us a, a high level overview. Like what is Snapshot? Why uh, did Fabian uh, found this project? Uh, and, you know, maybe talk about maybe some of the current use cases uh, in terms of maybe DAO governance and why even governance is necessary in DAOs. Snapshot came to be in 
uh, August 2020, when Balancer, uh, uh, a decentralized exchange, uh, decided that they needed a solution for people who had token in liquidity pools to still be able to participate in governance. And that was quite key, to be honest, because if you're going to do decentralized governance as a project, as a DeFi project, you also want your users to be able to use the project and vote. So the fact that it wasn't composable was very problematic. You had to choose between using your tokens and voting with your tokens, which just goes against the ideal of decentralized governance. So they asked Fabien, like, try to build something. <laughs> Do your best, you know, the kind of thing where you just send a, a, a wild engineer on, on a very complicated task and, you know, carte blanche, as we say in French. Do, uh, do however you want, like, just make it work. And magically, <laughs> in my view, it's quite magical because it's a very complicated system. And magically, he managed to make it work. Uh, and so all of a sudden, Balancer was able to have this new governance system uh, that, you know, was completely capable of voting with tokens and liquidity pools and voting with you know, loads of different things. Uh, we'll, we'll get back on that later. Uh, and they said, all right, this is your company. This is your intellectual property. Go on, do your thing, develop this because it has a lot of potential. And very quickly, more and more DAOs, Yuan Finance, uh, YAM, for those that remember YAM, uh, all of these, <laughs> all of these uh, DAOs and all of these DeFi projects started using Snapshot. And it only grew and grew. For the first year of its existence, it grew quite quickly especially since uh, Fabien and, and, you know, a little bit after two other developers uh, were the only ones working on it and maintaining it. But it quickly became like a key piece of governance for most projects. Today, uh, and I really don't say this to, to brag or something, but it's much easier to say projects that don't use Snapshot than projects that do use Snapshot. And so Snapshot is kind of this hybrid blockchain governance, but also relies on off-chain elements. But these off-chain elements are also decentralized because we're using uh, something called IPFS, which is a decentralized uh, storage system, which you know puts your data in many different servers across the world to make sure that it's always accessible and it's always protected. And basically, these votes they're kind of stored as uh, on IPFS, and we have uh, let's say a hub that relays all those votes into the results that you see on the on the snapshot UI. And so Snapshot is, I think, one of the only blockchain projects that has this kind of on-chain, off-chain architecture. I know that uh, Discord at XYZ is working on something similar for reputation and that sort of stuff. But, uh, but yeah, we're quite happy with it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good system and it managed to reduce fees massively in terms of governance. And so I think second point of your question was, how do you vote on Snapshot? And so basically the idea is, well, you can vote with tokens. That's the most simple. But in general, I think there's about 200 different strategies. And strategies are what we call the different things that we can look at to induce voting power. And these different things, they could be an NFT. They could be an ERC-1155. Uh, they could be a staked token. Uh, they could be, you know, an amount of actions you've done on a blockchain. They could be the <laughs> the number of days that you've held a certain token. Uh, all of these are possible to look at on Snapshot. And this would never be possible in basic on-chain governance because basic on-chain governance looks at a certain block and says, well, at this block, person X had 12 tokens, so 12 votes. And on Snapshot, you can change that massively because you can take into account pretty much anything. If we can verify it, and if, if we can have a trusted source from which to read you know, a certain information, this can count as voting power. And when I'm saying super flexible, I mean, kind of any JavaScript file would be sufficient to derive voting power. You could have like a white list of addresses that have one, one vote. There's a strategy called ticket, and ticket is basically any address on Ethereum has one vote. And all of these strategies, you can kind of mix and match them on Snapshot. You can have up to eight strategies in your space. And I like the example of Decentraland. Decentraland, you vote with your token. You vote with your estate size. Uh, you vote with your NFTs on Decentraland. You vote with the amount of 
different, you know, estates, you know, locations, land that you've got. Uh, all in all, they've got like six or seven strategies that give a certain amount of voting power to each of their user. And all of this, they can do for free. Like Snapshot is 100% free. No, no ads, no data harvesting, no, no nothing, no fees. And yeah, so we're quite happy to be able to kind of provide that service to all of these very exciting and very creative DAOs and DeFi projects. Yeah, that's amazing. And thank you again for the wonderful breakdown in terms of, you know, what is Snapshot and kind of some of the different ways that people can use them. We're talking about voting, uh, you know, as as a superpower here for uh, some of these projects. And you brought up Balancer and how they were, uh, you know, kind of they set out this, 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 I guess, challenge to Fabian to create a product that allows for voting for their DAO. Can you maybe walk us through, you know, at a very high level, why Balancer or any DAO for that matter needs people to vote and then maybe connect that to the kind of that that world that Snapshot opens up and facilitates to both the projects like the, the protocols or DAOs and to the community to interact in that way? Um, what? I think that there's two explanations for two different kinds of DAOs. I think, let, let's go for the first because I think it's the easiest uh, and it's the most straightforward. You've got kind of community-based DAOs. Let's call them social DAOs. And these DAOs, they're, they're all about community. They might be centered around an NFT profile picture project. They might be around something like proof of humanity. Uh, you know, they, they might just represent a group of people that want to buy a football club together. It, all of these DAOs need to make decisions based on whatever goals they set themselves. But that's not the only reason why they vote. I think they also vote because voting gives a great sense of apartness. Like all of a sudden, you're, you're actually part of the community. You're voting, you're deciding, you're not, uh, uh, you're not like a visitor, you're an actor of this community. And I think this is a very important part of why people vote that we sometimes forget. Even if our vote isn't that impactful, I think it's extremely important that our voice is heard. And the mission, uh, uh, you know, if we had to have like one very abstract high level mission for Snapshot is just making sure that humans participate more and have a have a stronger voice in the community that they're a part of. Because we think that's kind of key to the human experience, really. You, know, you, you want to be an actor in your own life and in the community that you love. So that's for social DAOs. They have to make decisions. It gives a strong sense of community. Now for more, you know, maybe let's say financial DAOs, more serious DAOs. That could be investment DAOs. It could be DeFi projects. Well, voting is quite often built into the system. For example, if you're looking at something like Curve, people vote with their CRV tokens to decide which CRV pools get as much you know, uh, rewards for a certain period. I think it's two weeks. So built into the, syst- uh, to the, to the system that you know, makes Curve work, which I think is, is like the biggest DeFi project in terms of total value locked, Voting is key to the functioning, to the very core of the project. But for other projects, let's say Balancer, for example, voting is going to be the, the, you know, the way that certain key decisions that have to be made by the team are made. And so let's take an example. If you're on Balancer uh, and you want a certain amount of rewards for different pools, well, the team could choose. The team could say, well, it's going to be simply... Uh, we're going to give more to people we like and less to people we don't like. Maybe we're going to sway, you know, balance in a certain direction. And instead they're saying, no, we're going to let the community decide because this protocol is neutral. The protocol that we're building, we're, we're the balancer team. I think it's called balancer labs. We're the balancer team. We're going to build a protocol. But then afterwards, that protocol is controlled by the users, not by us directly. And this is the in my view, the key innovation of DeFi. The key innovation is saying, this is not going to be something that's you know, just web to under a new code. Not like we're just changing the, <laughs> we're just kind of changing who's in charge, but this time it's us. 
So it's the same product in the end. It's we're going to build something and we're going to give away the keys to the community and the community is going to decide what goes on, who's accepted, who's in, who's out. And I think that's that's super important. That's that's key to the long-term health of a protocol. And that's how we make sure that we're not on the road to become a new big tech, but with different people at the top this time. I, I really like to bring up this kind of comparison where you know Google's motto is don't be evil. I think Web3's motto is can't be evil. It's not about not being able to do bad things. Sorry, it's about not being able to do bad things, not not doing bad things because we're good people. The idea is to kind of remove a central point of failure from the equation and make sure that forever the people who participate and who use a product are its owners. And if you start thinking about what this means for you know, some of the key systems that you use your entire life, it's amazing when I think about like public transport or when I think about like my favorite video game or my favorite DeFi project, obviously I want a stronger voice in how it's run. And I think that's where governance is key. And often governance gets sometimes a bad rep. People say governance is slow. It takes more time. I, I just wish the team would get on and, and do that thing. But I think the reason why it takes more time is that we're building on stronger foundations. And that's good. That's long-term excellent for this space. Yeah, that's... That's really great. You know, that just to me just brings so much to mind in terms of, you know, the space and I guess some of the challenges that governance has enabled or excuse me, some of the challenges that have existed that Web3 has been able to solve, you know, through, you know, some of its composable layer, the permissionlessness, the decentralization, you know, and I I guess for me, one thing that I would like to emphasize, because I think that this is uh, crucial to understand is that ability for a community to make decisions that align with their own values, right? And I think that that is huge in the space of Web3 because that is what we're facilitating, right? Is we are developing these platforms and protocols where if they're the many don't align with the few, they can vote out those few to then go on and kind of govern that the way that they would prefer to. Or the other is just simply forking that and creating something and then the majority comes to you and then the value goes to that new community, right? Absolutely. I think you're touching on something really important, which is not only do you have governance, but you could be scared of stuff like tyranny of the majority, but it's crypto, it's open source. You can redo your own thing. The the ethos of this space is, is incredible. And I find that amazing that still today, most of these protocols, I, I, I can think of only a few counter examples, are still building open source. This would have been unheard of 15 years ago. Unheard of. Yeah. So, you know, I guess one other thing to kind of point out here too is the space of Web3 is constantly evolving. I mean, even the language, right? The, the, the words we use today, like Web3. I know when I first came in, we weren't talking about Web3. We were talking about blockchain. We were talking about crypto. Uh, certainly we're talking about decentralization, but like the language changes. But I think part of that is because the technology changes, the use cases change, right? Like DAOs being a novel and emergent property of Web3. Um, I think these are really wonderful examples of why adaptability is key right in this space um and so i'm curious to hear like some of uh, uh, some of how snapshot has adapted you know to the uh emergent changes of web3 and maybe talk to some of the ways that you are building out snapshot into the future to maybe be more aligned to the way that the community is is demanding the the platform to change yeah so it's really based on on two things i think the community wants completely neutral snapshot and this is why i think a lot of people it's funny because at the same time i feel like snapshot is quite famous and at the same time it's extremely non-famous at all loads of people have used snapshot and i've never realized it uh i'm often surprised when i meet people that are deep into this space and when I explain what Snapshot is, they're like, oh, yeah, of course I've used it. I've used it through this UI or that UI. Uh, there, there's so many projects that, are, that have integrated. You know, Decentraland, for example, you're going to be voting on Snapshot, but you're going to be voting on Decentraland's website. And that's the same for Balancer. That's the same for, uh, you know, Commonwealth. 
And all of these snapshots is kind of the back end. And I think we're quite happy with that role because we know that we're handling extremely sensitive data. Voting is extremely important data. And our role has to be infrastructure only. So while I'm a relatively loud voice, I quite enjoy snapshot not having a, a loud voice in terms of, you know, what goes on and what happens in, in the Web3 space. Because we're here to facilitate that discussion. We're not here to, you know, be extremely vocal about what we need to do ourselves. You can't be both. You can't be part of this. <laughs> you can try to be slightly part of the discussion. And that's why we put so many tools at the disposal of the communities, but we never tell them you have to use it. For example, we've introduced quadratic voting because quadratic voting is extremely cool. It's this idea that your voting power is going to progress on a logarithmic curve instead of a, line, a linear one. So instead of having, if you have 100 tokens, instead of having 100 voting power, you're going to have 10, you know, square root of 100. And if you have four tokens, instead of having four voting power, you're going to have two. So all of a sudden, you have five times less voting power than the other guy instead of 25 times less voting power than the other guy. Uh, so we love that. We think that's amazing. That's a great start of a solution to to the plutocracy that, that is sometimes rampant in crypto. But we've never forced it upon anyone. It's an option you can choose, but you don't have to choose it. You you can choose to do whatever you want. And I think this is actually quite central to the success of Snapshot is that it doesn't push an agenda. It doesn't push a structure on DAOs. It recognizes that there's so many smarter people than us in this industry building so many smart things that if we try to be thought leaders at the same time that we're trying to build this infrastructure, we're, we're just going to, we're not going to be good enough on both. So we just choose one, which is building the infrastructure. To get back on, on your point, in many cases, what we're building right now is things that make us more neutral. And that could be, I think the flagship of that, and we were alluding to it at the beginning of the conversation, is our partnership with Starkware. Because on StarkNet, the layer 2 ZK rollup, we're going to build Snapshot X. And Snapshot X is going to be governance contracts. And once these contracts are deployed, and once they're sufficiently fleshed out, we're sure that everything works well. These will be completely independent. No one, including us, will have any control over the Snapshot X contracts. And that means that you could build a new UI, a new front end in front of the Snapshot X contracts, just like we could. And anyone will be able to use Snapshot X however they want. You know, the backend, the protocol is going to be completely free of any human interaction that could change the way things function. And so once you've got a tool like that, that's extremely powerful. Because in the same way that you could build a front end, you know, I, I don't know, maybe Belgium could build a front end to Snapshot X and then use it for its own national election after it's been battle tested enough and there's been million votes of Indians of votes on it, maybe the, this is something that makes sense for Belgium. Maybe it makes more sense for <laughs> developing countries, for example. Uh, but, but I don't know, maybe Belgium will surprise me. <laughs> yeah, so this is kind of key to like our, our future direction. It's making snapshot something completely independent from even our infringements upon its, uh, you know, upon its own smart contract and functioning. And apart from that, the other kind of two key directions that we're going into is facilitating participation. So facilitating participation is just about making sure that as many people as possible votes. We want to make sure that people can quickly scan through a proposal, understand its content, and vote quickly. And part of that is going to be a mobile app because, you know, people have a lot of time to kill on their phone sometimes. You know, you're waiting for your bus or, or something and you know, you're going to be able to have this quick notification, look into what the DAO needs you for and quickly vote yes or no on, on that certain proposal. And, and we think that this is super important to get people that are even, you know, small fishes in a notion of big whales uh, to still participate. Because, yeah, if you lower the barrier of entry as much as possible, then you're really allowing people to participate uh, as much as possible. And that's really key to our design philosophy of, of Snapshot. Well, I really like that last point you're making there in terms of you know developing something that is maybe more accessible. 
I think in terms of like mobile friendly apps, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think around the world, it's more likely that someone will have a mobile device and they will have a desktop computer. So yeah, so I think there's something to be said about creating an application that allows for anyone, regardless of what part of the world they live in, has access to governance and has then a voice in that community to influence the decisions that are made, to uh, really uh, build something that aligns with the many and not the few. And so I think that that's really wonderful. I think one of the things that for me, as I certainly see as a challenge is accessibility and governance. And uh, this definitely would be one good example of how inaccessible governance can be, you know, not just in terms of the technology that you need to have to be able to participate in governance, but also the ability to recognize when there are governance decisions uh, that need to be made uh, in a community. I think in DAOs, it's easy to get people excited about, you know, getting involved but it's very difficult to getting them to act on that. And I think part of that is a challenge in attention, uh, a challenge in incentives, right? So there needs to be more alignment, you know, in, in both of these areas. And certainly I think that Snapshot is having something that can allow more people to participate more easily. Like you said our phones are probably with us more than anything else. And in some parts of the world, that's the only thing we do have. So bravo on that. That's really exciting. I can't wait to hear some of those updates as they happen. As we are coming towards the top of the hour here, I'm curious if you could, you know, tell us like, what are some of the things that you see into the future based on like your interactions with the community and the work that you do at Snapshot that you're very excited about? You know, in general, what gets me the most excited these days in crypto is when people use crypto and don't realize it. It's when crypto is simply a better solution. And this makes me think of like early, early internet days where people were using in the internet because they were really enthusiastic about it, but not because it was actually better than going to the store and buying the newspaper. <laughs> and, and, and in a way, this is this moment is happening more and more with crypto, where People are exchanging money on blockchains, not because it's cool, but because it's better. And use cases like these, they're, 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 I, I think there's more and more of them. You know, one of the things that makes my blood boil is, is hearing that Western Union is going to take a 20% cut on money that, uh, you know, people in the U.S. are going to send back to their families outside of the U.S. That I, I, can't ima I, I can't believe that in the 21st century, this is a kind of practice that still exists and and, and honestly, is is even sometimes celebrated amongst the, the the wealthiest bankers. So this is where crypto has to come in and change things. Everywhere that there's inefficiencies in systems, there's middlemen getting their pockets full of money on on the basis of the uh, of the work of other people. This is where crypto has to simplify things. Uh, I think two days ago, I, I I found this really cool music NFT made by uh, Headless Chaos. And basically, I thought it was really cool in general. I loved the music. I, I thought it was excellent. M music is pretty much my, my, my biggest interest outside of crypto. So I really wanted to buy a thing. And then I realized, oh my God, 0 0.2 ETH, that's still, that's, that's a lot of money for, you know, I'm a vinyl collector. So I've, I'm not completely estranged to buying a lot of expensive music stuff. But then I realized this is 80 artists that collaborated. And of the, you know, I think it, it represented maybe $360. That means I'm directly donating $4 per artist. And a contract that was splitting that money is something called uh, zero X split, which is a contract that immediately disperses that money without any intermediaries and without fees. And this is incredible. <laughs> the, the, the problem of royalties in music is, is so complex and now on a blockchain, we can have it completely transparent, completely programmed by a smart contract, and my money goes directly to the artist. You know, when I'm when I'm paying a concert ticket, 40 euros, how much of that actually goes to the artist? When I'm listening to a song on Spotify, how much of that actually goes to the artist? And this you can find in, in so many industries. It's not even the music industry, it's the financial industry. And, and sadly, I think in many countries still today, you're voting and who knows where your vote goes. What I'm hoping we can do here is change things, simplify things, and bring this interesting technology this, to as many people as possible 
because it's an empowering technology. It's a, it's a technology of human empowerment. And I think if we manage to keep that ideal in mind, and if we build something that's really solid and we, we don't get, you know, it's very easy sometimes to get distracted by, by greed, by the crazy amounts of money sometimes that are flowing in crypto, to lose sight of the main goal. And the main goal is making humans more, you know, powerful in their environment, making like a fairer, you know, playing field for us all to play on. And all of these applications that are building something that is kind of changing the ways humans interact with each other in in better, what I'm I'm so bullish on that. And I'm, I'm truly hoping uh, that Snapshot will one, you know, will reach that status and, and will change the lives of many people. I, I'm, I'm extremely hopeful that this will happen. And I think it's not the only one. There's so much good stuff building in crypto. And obviously, like we touched on it at the beginning of the conversation, we hear about the scams a lot more than we hear about the good stuff. But the good stuff is awesome. Uh, I think if you spend enough time in crypto, you start recognizing that good stuff almost intuitively. And, and that's that's just amazing. So, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to many, many more years in crypto at this point. And that's a wrap. I truly enjoyed my chat with Nathan. And I hope you did too. If you'd like to connect with Nathan, you can find him on Twitter at NathanVDH0X. And to learn more about Snapshot, follow them on Twitter at Snapshot Labs or go to their website, snapshot.org. Thank you for listening to Crypto Sapiens. If you enjoy this type of content, I would appreciate it if you would give us a five star review wherever you enjoy your podcasts. And to keep up with our latest developments, you can find us on Twitter at Crypto Sapiens underscore and our website at cryptosapiens.xyz. Stay tuned for our next discussion.